Well, welcome to today's Football Collective session. On the 25th of May 2020, George, George Floyd, a 46-year-old black American man, was brutally killed in Minneapolis during an arrest for allegedly using counterfeit money. As he pleaded, stop, I can't breathe, the world saw that the punishment did not fit the alleged crime. The Black Lives Matter movement spread across the world, showing us how racism has many faces and ends. Not all racism results in the loss of life or outward abuse, but it carries manifest impacts. Racism can also be accidental, everyday, and certainly embedded within the power structures of society. Well-intentioned people can be accidentally racist, perhaps owing to the assumptions of the culture around them. Today's session is on racism and racialized injustices in football and the movements against it. Make no mistake, discriminations and injustices are multiple. While overtly racist chants may be becoming less common at football grounds, we have recently seen racist groups masquerading under the name the Football Lads Alliance, but this only scratches the surface of the problem. Our colleagues Alice Cashmore and Jamie Clellan pointed out that in men's football in England and Wales, the number of black football managers consistently holds up between just two and four out of 92 Premier League and EFL clubs. Why do so few black football players move into management and media positions in football? And why, once in such positions, a black manager spells in charge demonstrably shorter than white colleagues? My name is Peter Millward and I'll only, I'll only be light touch chair in this session. In truth, I really think that a black colleague's voice should be asking the questions today, but football isn't, al isn't alone in unconscious and structural biases. Every area, of, uh, every area of society experiences it, and higher education, the area from which I'm based, is certainly not immune. Black colleagues are underrepresented at every level in higher education. The higher up the structure you go, the more un underrepresented they are. I have to assume I've been affected by the racist values that are just everywhere. And so my job is to just to ask a couple of questions to prompt the discussion and then shut up and listen to our esteemed colleagues on the panel. Listening, just really, really listening is the only way I can ever learn anything of their experiences. So I'll briefly name the panelists before handing over to them for fuller introductions. From Kick It Out, we have Troy Townsend and Ose Sankofa. And from Leicester University, we have the sociologist Paul Campbell. So over to the panelists first to tell us a bit about yourself. Troy. Can you start by introducing Kick It Out and yourself and the role you have at Kick It Out? So over to oh. Troy first. Good morning, everyone. Um, I always hate going first because I don't know whether how to pitch it, whether I'll go long or short. So um, I'll try and keep it short. Um, so Kick It Out, obviously myself and my colleague, Oze, work for have been obviously established within football now for wow. 27 years. Um, a lot of people would say, sorry, I'm getting a lot of feedback on what I'm saying. Sorry, so um, we've been fighting racial inequality and discrimination within football now for that period of time. Uh, we were originally started back in 1993 as Let's Kick Racism Out of Football with the pure focus on, on supporting black players and the kind of incidents that were happening in the late 80s and early 90s and our, our former chair, Lord Erman Usley, was responsible for, you know, starting up the organisation and empowering players to come forward um, and to speak about their experiences. But also, I would say, to challenge the industry as well as to what it was doing in regards to racism. Four years later, we changed to Kick It Out, where we encompassed all forms of discrimination. Um, so that again we were kind of like the body that people were coming to, to to challenge the very narrative that continued to exist for far too often um a lot of people will say well have you really been successful but i'll leave that up to, to everybody to gauge but i i don't like to gauge success because how can you be successful in this fight against racism and, and discrimination my personal role is to provide education so for the last i've been in the organization now for nearly nine years um, you can probably tell it on my face, the lines are, are, are getting a little bit longer and wider. Um, I provide education into the academy environment. Uh, so I deliver and, 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 and process all the academy education from nines to under 23s, um, parents and staff as well. So there's a coordinated approach in terms of an edu the education aspect within those football clubs. Um, and that's right across the board, sorry, that's the Premier League through an Equality Inspires programme and the Football League through the Life Skills programme. The Premier League is mandatory. Um, the EFL, the LFE, which is a league football education, uh, they get a selection process of, of how many sessions they want to do. 
out of a number of educational sessions that I provided. Um, I also run the mentoring programme, so helping underrepresented people uh, try and find work within football or mentored within football uh, through a number of different aspects. And we've had two very, very good programmes, uh, events during the, the, this lockdown period one in the coaching circles and one in the media as we try and address the underrepresentation that is very high in those two circles. Um, and obviously the voice of when um, a number of these incidents uh, keep coming up, keep rearing their ugly heads and keep needing to be spoken about. So the challenging aspect obviously is making sure the authorities understand what it's like to be discriminated against, you know, what it's like to be racially abused, what it's like for players and their mindsets and, and also what the authorities are doing. Um, but I'm sure we'll get to the detail of that as we run through the course of the session. So hopefully that wasn't too long, but uh, it's kind of short and sweet there. Not at all. Thank you very much, Troy. And I say, could you tell us a bit about yourself and your role at Kick It Out? Yeah, for sure. Um, Troy has sort of touched on, you know, a, a lot of the, the education side that, that we do and that we work on. I assist Troy in the delivery of those equality inspired sessions at the Premier League and Football League clubs you know that's a, a, an area that's I'm very passionate about having been a professional footballer myself in the past so to get the chance to work with the next generation of players is something that I'm grateful to be a part of and it's so important that these players are empowered to not allow things that have gone on in the past to happen to them when they eventually become players or whatever it is that they go on to do in their careers Another part of my role is tutoring on an online equality and diversity course. So that is in partnership with Solent University. And that's known as the Inclusive Leadership in Football Award. And that's an online course that we were actually still completing when lockdown started. So we're trying to target the future leaders of football. A lot of those people are working at professional football clubs already. They're working in the community branches of the football clubs. They could be university students, they could be people working at a grassroots level, but it's for anybody interested in trying to improve their awareness of equality and diversity within the game. That's a course that I tutor on with a, with a couple of other tutors. Rory, one of my colleagues, is in here as well. So, you know, that's, that's a really important part of the work that we do. I also go and deliver lectures at universities. I work, I deliver training to adult groups in and outside of football, really, if, if, if time allows. But yeah, it's all about education and trying to, you know, the different audiences I speak to, if you're speaking to young, diverse people, you're trying to educate them on how they can navigate the spaces that they're in. And if you're dealing with people who are uneducated about these issues, it's about highlighting the issues and, and also teaching them about how they can interact better with diverse people who they may not have had much experience with in their, in their lives. Uh, so I've been in the role two and a half years now, been very aware of kick it out growing up obviously as a as a football player and very aware of racism and discrimination as a as a black man which has been highlighted a lot over the last couple of months fantastic thank you Jose and over to Paul um Paul as well as introducing yourself could you tell us a little bit about your British Sociological Association award-winning book football at ethnicity and community um yeah um I'll I'll um I'll go short as, as opposed to long. Um, a bit like my, how I was coached when I was a player. Um, but, um, well, no, actually the opposite. I was taught in a time when you went long as opposed to short. Um, so I've um, been a, a, a sports sociologist, particularly interested in, in race for about 10 years now. Um, previous to, to going into academia, I... I um, played football very briefly um, uh, at the kind of YT level and then in local football and then went into um, academia much later, sort of uh, as a mature student. So my interest in this is very much from a kind of lived and also academic perspective. My, my research is centred pretty much on the black experience, which you can't, um, you, you can't explore without um, dealing with issues of exclusion and race and racism. So the first book, um, Football Ethnicity and Community, um, really focused on local football predominantly and the ways in which um, African Caribbean community in Leicester especially used local football as a means of 
integrating, but also as a way of establishing themselves within the city over time. And really the, the exploring the history of this club over 40 years really kind of enabled us to understand the change in black experience from the 1970s through to, till 2010. Um, my latest book, um, Education, Retirement and Career Transitions for Ex-Black Footballers um, from, uh, uh, from Being Idolised to Stacking Shelves is a rather verbose title, but looks at um, the experiences of 16 um, ex-black footballers and their transitions into, into sort of mainstream life. And ironically, part of the reason why they were finding themselves or the book centers on them entering sort of mainstream everyday jobs is because the obstacles they faced in going into sort of coaching and management, which was their first uh, career um, uh, option and, and their preferred career option. Um, more broadly, sort of, we're involved in a lot of work as well with um, sporting equals. So at Leicester Dice, we also do something called uh, the Leaderboard Academy, which is uh, giving young people who want to go into the level of governance and on boards, giving them the skills and the social networks and, and also the kinds of capital to be able to access uh, governance across a whole range of sports and, and not just football. And, and interestingly, that also dovetails with some of my work at the university, which is looking at um, decolonizing the university and the really interesting parallels between some of the obstacles that we're seeing in sport and in, in, in footballers transitioning into sort of coaching and some of the kind of uh, blockages that we're seeing from students trying to transition into the academy. Superb, thank you, Paul. Um, I'm really interested in the idea of decolonizing the, the curriculum and the universe, the whole university setup. In fact, maybe something we'll get to later on. But um, I wonder if I could uh, begin with quite a broad question, um, which is, um, in your experiences, how racist is football and on what levels does racism in football operate? So who wants to have a first go at tackling this? Um, Troy. Yeah, I mean, Thanks, there's, there's no worries. There's no scale. That's, it's a, there's no scale on to say how racist is football, to be totally honest. I can tell you that it, it lands right the way through the game, um, from the highest level right down to the grassroots level. You know, we are in all intents and purposes a reporting bureau so we have two reporting officers in 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 our organization um two is never enough by the way um but the scale of what they have to witness and read um and report on it is is unbelievable you know so i would always say that i'm never shocked by what i see here or what what they you know present to me anymore because you know, the young police level at grassroots, I often call that the wild, wild west. Uh, you see a lot of what is happening out in society at the moment today has been in that arena for, for, for far too long to mention. And, and, you know, I was a coach during the period, you know, a grassroots coach and a non-league coach manager. Um, and, you know, it was a regular occurrence, you know, and it's... It's the fact that we're still talking in, in this day and age. It's the fact that we're still trying to implement change rather than have a process that has already seen change happening is the biggest worry for me. You know, yes, everyone's talking now, aren't they? Everyone's talking about black lives and everyone's talking about racism and, you know, how we deal with it. But we're having this conversation in 2020, which means I po always pose the question, have we played, paid lip service to it in the past? Have we never really delved into the problem in the way that we should have done that maybe would have meant that football could have presented the solutions when people were asking the questions, you know? So the scale of it is, 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 is off the roof. You know, I talk to professional players on a regular occurrence. You know, I, I empower young players to be able to speak up about the injustices that they feel, you know? And I think sometimes that football is not ready for that. It's not ready for that conversation, but... We've got a new wave of players now who are confident, who will not accept what players have had to accept in the past. 
um, who have platforms where they're not governed by their football clubs. So the social media platforms that they have now, they don't have to run certain posts by football clubs anymore or be at the hand of a, a press officer who says that will look bad on us. Um, and I would hope that this is the period now where we see change, you know. Um, I had to cut my hair last night because you didn't want to see the grey that was in my hair for the last month of talking about this topic. Um, but, you know, ultimately we've got to have hope and we've got to believe that we can get to a better place um, so that the future of the game is a lot better than what the past of the game has been. So picking up on that and for all three panellists, um, um, Troy, you, you talk about educating at, at, at youth level and empowering those young black players to be able to speak out. What happens if the whole structure above them just silences them? How do we go and we improve the situation for those people? Well, the education has to go right across the board. So, you know, the fact that I educate staff members as well now um, is important as a start. But until we start to infiltrate the very nature of, of, of the whiteness within our football organisations, then, you know, unfortunately, certain young players will find their pathways closed because they have spoken out. You know, there's a number of incidents that have recently where players have just said enough is enough. And what you find is that those players are no longer representing that football club anymore. You know, so ultimately, we've got to look at right across the board until we can address representation at the highest level. Then, unfortunately, the situations that I'm talking about will continue to to fester, um, to be to to not be dealt with in a manner that 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 really they should be. You know, the players' voices, at a, particularly at a youth level, will not be heard, um, or there'll be a consequence for for their actions of speaking out about what's happening. You know, behind closed doors, as such. You know. So there has to be better representation. That's for a start. Um, there has to be those uncomfortable conversations that many in the game, unfortunately, do not want. Um, and there has to be accountability, um, from my point of view. And I'll say, does this, does this tally with your experience too in your educational role going out to, and working with, with uh, young footballers? Yeah, definitely. I, I echo what, what Troy said. I, I think I think the key point that I would just like to raise before I start to, to say what I'm going to say is that the reason why we often can't have this conversation is because as soon as you mention the word racist, people shut down and they put their guard up. Because to, to call somebody or to even utter the word racism or that someone's racist, it's like you've it's like you're the devil reincarnated. You're, you're the devil himself almost when you say that. And I think when you say that structures are racist or when you say that football is racist, it doesn't mean that you're a KKK member and you want to kill all black people. That's, that's not what racism necessarily is. It's about a structure that allows the certain things to happen that shouldn't happen where black people and minorities are treated differently based on perceived actions that they may or may not you know, take on board. So I think that's, that's a key point to, to remember. I think when it comes to, you know, when I look back into my playing days, I remember, you know, vividly about how we were treated separately from the white players. You know, black players were always singled out in comparison to the white players. Hairstyles always singled out in comparison to white players. All types of behaviours. So as a young black person, you have to learn to navigate. Okay, if I do this, I'm going to be perceived like that. You literally have to be meticulous with how you go about your day to day just so you don't fall into a category and have to deal with certain things that you don't want to deal with. That's, that's also a huge part of racism. That's everyday racism that as a black person, you, you kind of just accept it because that's, that's life. We shouldn't have to, but it is life. And depending on your character and personality, it's going to affect you in very, very different ways. If you're a calm, mild mannered person, you're probably more able to deal with those situations. But if these things wind you up as they should, then you're going to react how you should, and people will then label you as, as that stereotype. I think of a great example, Troy, years ago, before we were even both at Kick It Out, was we won't name the football club, but I know you know what I'm talking about. We went into a football club to deliver a session with young players. The coaches were in this session. We were talking about racism in the session. The coaches were very right on with the message. We found out literally two weeks later that exactly what we'd been talking about, those coaches had been 
acting in that way towards those players and those coaches ended up being let go from the club for their racist actions. So people are good at paying lip service and good at saying the right things. But as Troy said, without that representation, you're not going to have any true, true accountability, in my opinion. So just going to endorse the point that Ozzy's just said there. In that situation, yes, the coaches were let go. You know, the coaches, but went on to continue their careers. They, they weren't sacked. It was a mutually agreed part separation of the ways. The players left the football club. Yeah. They were released. So ultimately, you know, where's the issue here? The issue is the culture that was set. The issue is the culture that allowed those coaches to believe that they could, and I'm going to open up and be honest here, throw a banana in a shower, switch the lights off and tell the players to smile, the black players to smile. Um, there's a culture that allows that. It's not just the two coaches that were eventually said, listen, you're no longer going to be at this football club. It goes right up across the board. So who is challenging that behaviour? Who is saying that ultimately, what have you done there? You know, and who has ripped up the contracts? Ultimately, it's the players who have been empowered by delivery to speak up, to understand that it's not right, who have then, it's cost them their careers. And this is why I say it's not just the two front facing people who, are, who have ultimately paid for their actions, although they've gone into employment elsewhere, one off to America and one somewhere else in the country. So that's not being dealt with effectively, but it's the culture that allows. So there's a, a, a ripple effect. Well, it's not even a ripple effect. It's a running water effect um, that has allowed those, those, those coaches to continue to exist. While those players, it's cost them their careers at that football club and ultimately would have cost them, would have cost, uh, you know, the thing is, I don't think people understand how much that kind of racism can affect an individual. But, uh, Ozzy spoke about the mindset, you know, and how, it, and how you have to deal with something like that. You know, going into work every day, knowing that something else is going to happen, knowing that you're going to be targeted absolutely just based on the colour of your skin, knowing that you're going to be subjected to the possibility of a banana or some other lazy racial connotations that affect your performance, a performance that is being judged all the time on whether you make it or not. That is scandalous. But that's the culture that the game has allowed for far too often. And so whilst we are putting out blacked out images and, and we're, we're talking about, I don't know, re lack of representation, when are we going to address the issues that have existed for far too long that has meant many player like me has gone out of the system, not wanting to be a part of the game anymore? Sorry if I've jumped in there, but I've just had to get that off my chest. Not not at all, no. Um, can, I just, can I just make one more, just okay. very quickly, yeah. just, just the last point. I think, you know, these players and members of society, they are very strong people. Imagine the mental resilience that you have to have to live daily in this way. You have to be extremely resilient. And for a white person who might hear one or two of these stories, it might not sound like much in someone's 20, 30, 40 year life. But the more you speak to black people, Asian people, they will all have very similar stories, literally word for word stories. And a lot of white people that I've seen, you know, people that I know personally have said people who have had black friends all of their life and assumed that because they know black people or grew up around black people, they understand black people's struggles. They have realized I didn't even know that that's the type of stuff you have to go through. I had no idea, even though they're literally best friends with black people, because we have to internalize it so much internalize it so much and just put it in the back of our heads to, to try and navigate us our way through our, through our lives. So I think that's, it's been a huge awakening for some people, but it's how that continues as we move out of lockdown and we get back to living in a different way. Our concern is that we've been here before, what's going to happen next? And the bananas and the turning off the lights and being told to smile get dismissed as banter, don't they? A white, a particular type of banter which is set the limits of that humor are set by white people who want to go and impose their judgments around what's funny and what's not how do we move away from that how do we how do we how do we change that whole value system is it only by is it only by reset, resetting football to have more black leaders i think um i think 
sorry, am I on mute? No, no, I'm not. I'm fine. Okay. You're on call. So, Thank you. I mean, I think what we're what we're talking about is part of the problem with the term racism, because racism umbrellas so many different types of interaction so many, so many different types of processes but it's also it's actually a word that is sometimes as unhelpful as it is helpful so what this means is is we're talking so for example we're talking about structural we're talking about uh, systemic racism we're talking about interactional and and everyday and microaggressions so what often happens is is people have a very narrow interpretation of what racism is and what racism looks like. So pretty much through the kind of uh, late eighties, early nineties, because we had quite overt racism where we'd have thousands of people uh, maybe doing monkey chants or being extremely kind of um, overtly racist in, in the stands. But because we managed to get on top of that so it wasn't as overt that somehow that was the end of racism and and so what happens is is and, and what the problem is is dealing with just one aspect of it doesn't mean that you've slayed inverted commas the beast that there kind of almost has to be interventions at every level on the one hand we need to look at ways in which we address the culture we need to look at ways in which we address microaggressions. So, for example, there might be a need for really kind of um, uh, strong sanctions for those kinds of interactions in the way that we would have in, in any organisation. So we might have kind of HR policies around uh, abuse and harassment. But equally, that will only deal with it at one level. So you'd also need something that needs to maybe reward clubs that, that maybe have, um, that can demonstrate um, diversity. And one of the things that we used to have, we used to have, for example, the, um, the, the FIFA Fair Play reward um, for teams that, didn't, that had the fewest yellow cards. And I think that gave them a back end route into Europe. Now, I'm not suggesting that's the same thing, but we could also look at ways in which clubs are rewarded significantly for the ways in which they diversify their, their workforce and, and their staff. Um, so I, I think there's a whole kind of plethora of interventions that are required because racism exists in so many different kinds of ways. So as, as I said at the start, if you're not careful, you can achieve one small aspect of tackling racism and feel that you've solved the entire problem. I think that's, been, that's pretty much characterized much of the FA's response. It's, it's sort of suggested that it's achieved equity with very little equality. How do we move beyond that then? Um, I, I think we kind of need to, to really identify what types of racism we are seeking to address. Are we seeking to address cultural? Are we seeking to address uh, representation at the, at the governance level? Are we trying to uh, address it at the kind of uh, the interventions for management and coaching and then also interventions for things that happen um, at maybe... Uh, in the in the changing room so we kind of need a whole set of different specific interventions and policies designed to tackle these different mass manifestations of racism is, is my opinion and troy Ozzy, are those are those um views that you would concur with troy or troy um yeah without doubt i mean there are programs you know in place there are programs that are being developed you look at the onboard program that the fa and the the pfa have, have put together for the last six years now i think it's about six years which is helping players who are transitioning out of the game 
um, or those that are existing in the game and people around them, so black ethnic minority players, to to get a grip on what the boardroom looks like, you know, to understand the, the, the whole makeup of a boardroom and, and how they can contribute to that. So to give them the tools to to be able to transition out and maybe get into boardroom roles. I was part of the cohort, I think Oz was as well. Um, it results in placements, it results in, you know, so I went on a, the Kent County FA board um, and I'm going to be open and honest here. When I walked onto that board as a, as a part of a voluntary placement, um, no one spoke to me for the first session. Um, and I was looked at in a, in a way as, well, what's he doing here? Although I was introduced as, you know, Troy Townsend, kick it out, part of the onboard program, we've got to connect. Um, and the makeup of that board was predominantly 60 plus, uh, one female and Troy Townsend, you know. Um, but they had a, a very forward thinking chair. Um, and I've got to say that by the the fourth week, third week, fourth week, I was getting lifts to the train station. Now, people may think, what do you mean you was getting a lift to the train station? Well, they changed their mindset about me. They changed their attitude. They now valued me as, as a part of a member of the board and what I could contribute to that board um, and didn't see me as the black guy who may have been coming in to judge them. You know, so they were open. Um, they were honest. And I've continued quite a number of those relationships as well. So, that, that you know, it, it proves that it can change. It proves that we can, you know, influence others. Um, but there's always a point where we're having to prove who we are, you know. So that's one initiative. Obviously, the Premier League and the FA have now announced, uh, sorry, the Premier League, the EFL, the FA um, have now announced a new coaching initiative, um, which will enable six coaches transitioning out of the game to to kind of get a work experience again over 23 months, you know. I'm not quite sure that's enough because the, the Premier League, every time there is one of these initiatives, it's around 72 clubs and it's never around 92. You know, we've got the recruitment code where, you know, our version of the Rooney rule, it's around 72 clubs, it's not around 92. So what we're saying is you can, you can infiltrate or come in and, and, and be a part of the, the, the middle tier and lower tier, but there's no way you're working your way up through, through to the elite tier um through through any of these initiatives you know and that's what where uh, i think people are not fooled anymore in terms of what is being rolled out at the moment people people in the game good people in the game good people around the game are well aware of what is going on and are prepared now to to, to call it out you know and unless we do you know come up with these these kind of opportunities that allow for change um then i think there'll be a general consensus that most of it is just doing it for the sake of doing it, you know, and, and, and that, and that can't be right. Just to note that I'm going to call for questions from the floor quite soon, but Ozzy, what, what do you have to say about? Yeah, I, I think the point that Paul made about the, the strategic aspects is, is, is very important because there has to be a, a top down approach there has to be schemes that Troy's mentioned that are going to enable, you know, talented people, people who are ready to go into these roles. That's obviously important, but that's still only going to be a very small percentage of people. There also needs to be a, a, a bottom up approach as well. And hopefully those two can meet at some point. I've, I've worked like I'm sure many people have, I've worked with young children, I've worked with adults and there are young children who by the age of seven, they already know who to be racist to. They already know who the, what the bad words are to use towards certain people. They already know the stereotypes by, by the time they're seven years old. So by the time they get to primary school, they already, they're well educated about racism. Who in the schools and who in the grassroots is there to change that mindset so that they see people in the classroom as the same as them? Because that way of thinking at that age is still going to carry through to adulthood on a certain level. So it's down to the whole of society. We keep on saying that football's a reflection of society. Of course it is. And football gets blamed for a lot of things. And football is far from perfect. But all of these people come from, come from the society. I've been to places outside of big cities where there's that one black kid in the classroom who is hoping that nobody recognises them, who is, has a, had a complete identity crisis because nothing nothing lends to what they think to them culturally to to how they've grown up and they have to internalize this for 11 years of school 
and then they're expected to go into adult life and be able to compete and cope like everybody else. This is happening up and down the country. I've, I've seen it. I see it everywhere I go. So the curriculum, I think someone mentioned about the curriculum, national curriculum must change. The way that we view each other must change. It's from top down and bottom up, in my opinion. But that, that bottom up approach, there are so many people suffering. Troy and I, we work in football. You know, we would be considered to a lot of people towards that top end elite end. If you've been a Premier League footballer for 20 years, you're going to have opportunities. But what if you're just an, an average kid that's grown up in a poor neighborhood and you're not really talented at anything? What, 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 how do you navigate that space? What about you? So I, I think both approaches are very much needed. You speak for yourself about elite end, Oz, yeah? <laughs> I, I'm middle to bottom. <laughs> but it does, it drives at that point you raised, doesn't it? What, what Ozzy just said drives at exactly that point you raised, Troy, about entering into the boardroom and having to doubly, trebly prove yourself in the eyes of, in the, eyes of the, the older white men that sit there. And any mistakes, any errors you get pushed out very quickly yeah but we, we we've lived this with this forever and a day you know you ask most black children their parents have already told them that you've got to work harder you've got to do more you've got to do that little bit extra um you know you've got to impress you've got to don't just you know work at middle ground you always work above and beyond it's instilled in us you know and and uh, i'm not saying that that that's what makes it right but it you know, I'd be loath to ask anybody who, who, you know, has walked into an environment where you're underrepresented, whether that's male, whether that's female, whether it's because of the colour of your skin, whether it's your faith, you know, to tell me that you don't have to go and prove yourself to, to an audience of, of, of white middle class men who have owned the game for, for this period, for such a long period of time, you know, so it, it, it's not new but it's a battle and challenge that we're having to obviously influence our young people with, like Ozzy has said, you know, and send out those very, very similar messages. Or do we send out messages that absolutely you'll be judged on your ability alone, you know, and you'll be judged on your contribution alone rather than judged on, on, on based on the color of your skin. And, and unfortunately I can't confidently say that at this present stage. And that's quite sad, you know, and I don't want people to think that, uh, I'm, I'm talking about my experiences. Do you know what I mean? I'm talking about the experiences of others who have, who, who have contributed or, or, or have sat down with me and have told me these kind of stories. So I'm not coming at it just on a wing. I'm coming at it through one experience and two through conversations of other people's experiences. And, and yes, there are some that break the mold and let's not knock that, you know, it shouldn't just be a session today of, of let's knock everything. There are some of break that broken the mold and have opened the door, but I've got two hands and I'm not quite sure I can, I can actually count all those on those two hands, to be totally honest. So that that's fundamentally, you know, Ozzy's right, you know, top down and, and bottom up. It, that is definitely the approach, but we have to have the appetite to do it. There has to be the appetite for that change. You know, there has to be an appreciation and understanding that football has failed, you know, in, in representation, in equality, in, in opportunity, you know, for far too long. And unless there is that, that understanding and appreciation and acknowledgement, then we're going to be hosting this webinar again next year. And you're going to ask me, Troy, well, what has changed in a year? And I'm going to say, well, those two initiatives back in June of 2020 have, have just continued, but the, I don't see any representation and representational change at the highest level, you know? And I think that that's the minimum that we're asking for. Can I just add to that, Pete? Please do. Um, I, just to add to what Troy said and, and to, to kind of what you said, to take it a bit further, I think it's certainly not just older white middle class or older white men. This is something that is cultural and across the board. So what um, Ozzy said about, um, for example, uh, culture. So this idea of you boys, you boys do this, so you boys will like that. You black boys will like that kind of music. Oh, oh that, that's about you boys. That kind of humour and that kind of thinking about race bodies in football is something that happens in the academy changing room and in terms of banter. It happens in terms of uh, professionals in, in the professional game. And, you know, 
I know, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of, I know we've been avoiding saying names, but we've seen cases like Malky Mackay at West Ham and the way that he speaks about or was caught speaking and referencing uh, black players and the kinds of things that they do. The research that I've found that the players have said that to, to get in the social networks with the managers, they have to accept the kinds of ways in which or almost overlook the ways in which um, they, they talk and the banter and the, and the framing of black players and even down to humour like um, one, one of the, one of the um, uh, uh, interviewees said that, you know, they would be routinely um, humour about uh, the size of their penis. I'll keep that thing away from, from, from my wife. You know, this is not something that is going to die out when this generation part, this is something that is within the fabric of, of the game. So I think that's, that's something that we often tell ourselves to make ourselves feel comfortable, that this is something that's dying with the previous generation. But, but racism in this culture is resilient and it's been here this long for, for a reason. And it's not just gonna, you know, to, to, use, to use a term that's been bounded about, it's not something that's gonna miraculously disappear in the summer. And it's not just fab it's not just within the fabric of the game it's in the fabric of everywhere isn't it the whole society I, I yeah don't... it is in the fabric of society but you know we're talking about football and 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 uh, you know everyone says you know it's a societal problem it's not a football problem well then why do we discuss it in football then you know so we have to discuss it in football because it's the arena that most of us are are working in but are, are definitely interested in and and and, and would like change um, so it, you know, sports, as everyone knows, can be the, the the point of change as well. Can be the point of influence. Can be the point of education. Can do all the great things that we want it to do. And I'll just go back to the point of having the appetite to do it. So that I hear everywhere how you know football can make change in so many different areas. But when it comes to racism, oh no, it's a societal problem. Football can't help with that. You know, and we've got to sh stop that, shut down those those lazy narratives and, and start to believe that the power of the game and the power of sport generally has that influence. Um, and hopefully we are seeing, you know, elements of that um, in what's happened since the, the Premier League and the Championship have come back and, and the playoffs have come back and the power of the player voice. You know, someone like Ben Mee, you know, talking up about the banner that flew over at uh, the Etihad, you know, and as uncomfortable as what Ben Mee was, and you can see Ben Mee was uncomfortable. Why shouldn't he be? You know, he's talking about a life that's not his, you know, and, but he spoke with such purpose and prominence. And that's how we're going to change the game, by the power of those voices, by the allies that exist within football and continue to support and drive change. That's how we'll, we'll, we'll make this sport, you know, recognised as one that is the leader in change. And hopefully, that, but it has to do that internally first before it can, it can do that outwardly. Thank you. Uh, we've had three very interesting questions come in on the um, on the Zoom chat. So the first one has come from Ken McHugh. Ken, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, it's uh, it's about the Rooney Rule. Um, a long, long time ago, I introduced uh, the Arab Power, formerly of Kick It Out, uh, to Don Rooney. Don Rooney was the uh, USA ambassador to Ireland. So I was at a conference in Vienna and I introduced Pierre to him and the, we spoke about the Rooney rule and Pierre was to take it in as a as a fair, not just kick it out with a football yeah. against Western Europe uh, um, uh, campaign, but uh, it seems to have gone astray somewhere and uh, now it's a watered down version of the Rooney rule. I wonder why uh, the FA have rejected that. It's very strange. Yes, Paul, go on, you, you go, in case I'm controversial. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I think the Rooney rule is problematic um, because ultimately the FA can't enforce it. The clubs operate independently. Their own recruitment policies are independent and outside of the game's jurisdiction. So ultimately it's going to be very, it's very easy for clubs to sidestep something like the Rooney Wall at the moment, because if they, for example, sack a manager, on the Monday and they have a game on the Saturday, the Rooney Raw is on the premise 
that there's a whole interview process, a formal interview process, and that there's a set of candidates, and that within that set of candidates, then you include a, um, a BAME candidate. But ultimately, clubs, what we're seeing is not many clubs operate that kind of formal or recruitment process. So unless there is a kind of almost a manager's window where you can only sign managers within maybe pre-season um, and you can then have a period where there is a kind of uh, a, a gap for clubs to kind of go through maybe a, a four or five week process, then, then it's very, very difficult to kind of enforce on a club a whole system which the club could then go back and say, well, actually, hang on a minute, we need a manager in place on within five days. Um, and this is about staying in the league. And, it, and it's often these kinds of wider excuses which enable these practices to, to carry on. So either the FA has to, or the governing bodies have to kind of introduce a formalized process of recruitment across all clubs, or something like the Rooney Rule is just always going to fall down and have so many kind of uh, loopholes of which clubs can just continue to operate in the way that they do. Yeah, I endorse Paul's point there, Ken. Uh, it, it, it's, you know, it's, it's an, I don't blame the football clubs, by the way, at this moment in time, because absolutely the game has implemented its own version of the Rooney Rule, the recruitment code, in its own way. And it's given clubs that, that loophole or get out that Paul has just discussed because there's not an open recruitment process. And if there's not an open recruitment process, they're not going to be held to account. And by the way, how can you implement a process that only governs three quarters of, of the footballing environment whilst you're leaving the elite to continue to do as they want to do? So it, 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 it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's not fit for purpose. And, it, and it's the way that it's been designed in this country allows clubs to continue to do what they want to do in the manner that they do it, you know? So if I'm a chairman, I can sack Oze, sorry Oz, I can sack Oze tomorrow, knowing that I'm going to employ Paul because I've already had the conversations with Paul three weeks in advance. We all know how clubs work. We all know how yeah. they're never going to leave, most clubs, majority of clubs are never going to leave themselves open um, to, 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 you know, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks of not having a manager in place unless there's a trust within the person who's the caretaker manager who then has the opportunity to jump into the role themselves, you know? So it, I agree with you. It, it, it's, we seem to take on these initiatives almost as if we're forced to take them on. And then what we'll do is we'll then amend and change them where where absolutely it doesn't hold anyone to account. So I would say, what what is the point of the actual code in itself? And we've got a question which kind of connects with this now from um, Amy, from Amy Crack, which, um, Amy, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? Hi. Hi. <laughs> okay, so my question is, um, and it, it kind of comes from a, a dual, um, um, what do you call the word? There's a dual purpose to it. Obviously, I'm a woman um, and I'm black. And my question is, who holds the FA to account? I mean, we can have these conversations and even with people like yourselves who have a lot of experience and have a good standing in the game, but we're not having the conversations with the people who can make a difference. And we're allowing them to allow racism to become covert. Um, you mentioned lip service, and I think that is such a massive issue I see um, coach educators who themselves pay lip service to what they're delivering and I think if that's allowed then you know how can we make a difference I'm a grassroots coach how can I make a difference how can I challenge anybody when it's it's so you know it's so entrenched I mean actually as a woman I feel those exact same feelings being the only one in the room and my color doesn't even come into it because sexism is almost more of a thing for me than the racism. So I'm the only one in the room and I'm the one who has to be not just beyond reproach when I'm learning, but I also have to be somewhere up near the top 
in what I'm achieving in order to just be taken seriously full stop. So I have to work that extra bit hard and that's something I have to put on myself. I mean, I think going back to the original point was who holds them to account. Um, I've been in many a conversation with the bodies, the authorities, where, where actually they're not really listening to the words that I say. They're not really taking on board the challenges. You know, you'd, you'd think that they'd be open because, you know, everyone should be open to a conversation, particularly as, you know, I walk in as, as one of the only black representatives. But then I say, well, what is, what is happening? Where I don't physically see change. And, and, and they don't take too well. Uh, I'm being open here. They don't take too well to the conversation, you know. Um, or, again, the lip service is applied to the lip service, you know. Um, and that's the massive worry because we should be able to knock on any of those corridors and be able to say that, you know, the community or the people that are working within the game, players have touched base to it with us. And, you know, they're asking why this is not in place or why that is not in place. But it, it unfortunately, it, listen, I'm going to say this, it doesn't go down too well. Um, I don't know if you've seen overnight, um, the MLS obviously has returned. Um, and overnight, they've announced their first ever Black Players Coalition. Um, if you haven't seen it, I would go and have a look at it. It's all over Twitter and all over social media platforms. Um, they announced a formal partnership. There's the first part of change, by the way. Um, there's the first part of change in the fact that the Black players are coming together saying, that we are not accepting the kind of conversations or, or the, the, the lack of respect shown to us based on the colour of our skin. I'm going to say this now. I think that could go right across sports. I think there could be many sports people, figures, agents, whatever else you want to say, joining that coalition and making it a lot stronger and bigger to the point where, like we're saying, the whole reason why we're having this conversation is because enough is enough. You know, no longer are we going to accept... Um, the way that sport is, you know, and, and the way that sport seems to continually dehumanise you because of the colour of your skin or, or, you know, the fact that you're a man or a woman of, of, under, of an underrepresented group. And I think, listen, I've, I've done a little bit of detail on it and, and the football might be worried at the moment that that could, could, you know, extend over into this country because the power of the player voice is becoming more powerful. I, I, I didn't think that players truly recognize their power um, in their voice because normally it is it is you know fro cold water thrown over it but the players together together initiative has proved that the power of the player voice is, is getting stronger and stronger and if it's only the players that they listen to and we can help with the conversations in terms of what we feel players should be the questions players should be asking and what directive they want then for me I don't mind who it comes from as long as we are now challenging the, the very nature of what has continued to happen for far too long. So it's one of the most optimistic things I've seen over a long, long period of time. Like I said to you, I've been in this game for nine years, Amy. And when I say for nine years in my current role, I've been a grassroots coach forever and a day and a non-league manager and worked in schools. You know, I haven't seen anything like this at the moment. Um, and along with this, this coalition, this could be to the very point that we start to, to think we've finally got a handle on, on, on what we want to achieve. But there has to be structure to what we've, we, we achieve. You know, there has to be a, you know, it, it has to be marked out what, what, what people want when it's changing the game, particularly on this topic, because we can all talk and we can all talk and we can all talk. But unless we put a bit of structure in the way that we talk to challenge the, the, the very narrative that continues to exist, then it will just wash over, wash, wash over everyone's head again. So, I'm optimistic, as I always, always am, but I'm really cautious <laughs> as well, by the way. Um, I'm really cautious because if you'd say to me after Raheem Sterling, um, you know, we, we thought there was going to be change. You know, after England, Bulgaria, we thought there was going to be change. There was a banana thrown on a Premier League football pitch back in 2018 and no one called it racism, by the way. So, you know, if those things are happening and everyone's saying this is the point of change, and then all of a sudden we just go back into the same way of thinking all the time. Um, then something has to give. And I think this coalition um, from the US may be the point of change because it will pick up momentum. It will pick up momentum and it will pick up drive and it will get people for, you know, 
big people from other sports wanting to be involved as well. And I think that could be the point where all of a sudden, as long as there's a structure to it, change will start to happen. Thank you, Troy. I'm really mindful of time and I've had two other questions come in. So could we take the two questions together and then the panelists could maybe um, answer across them. So the first question was from Sean and then the second one, Sean Huddleston, and the second one was from Mark Deutsch. So if we take Sean's first, Sean, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi, hi guys. Um, my, my question was, does social media have a role in continuing or even emboldening current levels of racism and forms of racism? Thank you, Sean. And if we take marks at the same time as well? Uh, yeah, I was going to pick up on the point that Troy made about ben, me making a comment. And is there a role for white allyship and is there any education on sort of helping the white allies or the non-black allies in the dressing room to stand up to the racist abuse that's taking place? Thank you. So if we go over to the panel, um, Ozzy? Unmute yourself. Sorry, yeah, I was just writing down uh, the questions quickly. Just on the, on the white allyship, yeah, I think what Ben Mee did the other day was, was incredible because you could tell that it touched him. You could tell he was embarrassed and he knew that he had to do something. And I think the more that we have influential white people who feel empowered to speak out, I think that will speak to the people who are perpetrating a lot of, a lot of these things. I, I, I remember when Raheem Sterling came out and, and spoke after England games after recent racist abuse. And in private conversations that I've had, I always said, imagine if it was Harry Kane that was delivering that message with a huge amount of passion and a huge amount of you know, anger at people who are still behaving in this way. That has a much bigger impact because Harry Kane will have that affection from people already. He's the captain of his club. He's the captain of, of England. And we need more of that rather than one or two black faces that have to consistently put themselves above the parapet to make a message that everybody should be making. This idea of allyship, obviously it's a great word and, and it's something that's needed, but it, it, you, at some point we have to decide what's right and what's wrong. If any of us see something that's wrong, we should automatically speak up passionately and say, no, that's wrong and it's got to stop. And you've got to say it like you mean it. But unfortunately, I feel that, especially within football, and this isn't to blame fans for everything, but nobody wants to go to war against their fans. A, a large part of this behaviour online or in stadiums is from football supporters. When football supporters behave this way, people say, oh, but they're not real fans. Well, if they've been going to the club for 20 years and their dad had a season ticket, well, I think they are football fans. They're not very good ones, but they are football fans. Uh, but nobody wants to go to war with their fans and say, listen, if our fans can't behave themselves, we're going to close down part of our own stadium. That's how serious we are about it. We're going to educate our own fans. We're going to make sure that before fans buy a season ticket, they have to sign some sort of disclaimer, do some sort of education. We're going to have messaging in our programs on our match day screens about how we're not going to tolerate any racism. And the club captain's the one saying it. The club chairman's the one saying it. There's, there's so many things that you can do but no one wants to upset the fans because if you call someone racist or utter the word racism, you're accusing me of being the devil himself. So we need to get away from that. It doesn't mean you're the worst person in the world, it, but it does mean that you need to change your actions. You need to change your, your attitude. So I think my, my, I'll end by just saying it's about right and wrong. If something's wrong, you're supposed to speak out. That's how we're all taught as, as kids. Thank you, Ozzy. And Paul? Um, yeah, I, I um, I think uh, Sean's question about social media, um, I may be slightly personal, but I, I have no faith in, in social media at the moment, particularly with regards to how um, social media seems to be a platform that um, has, has been something that's been a, a channel for racism directed towards black players. Yes, there have been voices of support, but um, I'm, I'm not sure of the, the role of social media as a platform in itself. Um, but I think more importantly, uh, to Mark's point about allyship, I think part of the problem is, uh, and Mark mentioned abuse, and I, I think that's a really key point, because as, as helpful as Ben Mee's point was, it was an easy point to make, because it was an obvious case of racism. You had all the players, unified 
doing uh, in, in support of Black Lives Matter and the, um, uh, the the banner that was flown across. It was something that was quite obvious and, and easy to get on board with. Um, and even though he did show a lot of bravery and, and, and was, uh, I, I think that shows almost how low the bar is in terms of what we're expecting of white colleagues. Um, and I think the real trick is getting white allies to see racism in the not so obvious or more difficult places. So for example, um, um, uh, Darren Bent mentioned about um, uh, Burnley's team being almost entirely white. Now that was some, to be honest, I think in the contemporary game, it's actually quite hard to have a squad that doesn't have one person of colour in it. So that's a fair comment. But I wonder how many players in that Burnley changing room looked around and said, hang on a minute, we haven't got one visibly black player here. Paul, all I would say about that is that Darren had to retract his comment, by the way, because McNeil is in that Burnley changing room. Aaron Lennon it was part of that Burnley squad. Um, and whilst you can say that it's not a massive representation, it is still representation. So Darren sure. Bent sent out an apology to McNeil. Sure, I, I get where I, you're coming. I, hear, I get where I you're hear, going. Yeah. I hear the point, but but what I'm I'm saying is is even to to have a team on the pitch at that point. And yes, um, uh, McNeil's uh, a, 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 um, a ethnicity is. He, he self-describes in that way, but, but what I'm saying is, is, is more to the point, and okay, um, is uh, when, and because this is something that applies broadly to academia and to other organisations, where we have white allies subscribing to obvious forms of racism, but then being in places where more systemic racism is prevalent, i.e. within spaces which are completely whitewashed and not mention it there. You know, allyship is something that um, needs to take place and happen at all levels, not just in the instances. Everybody can sort of subscribe to um, the horrific murder of, of George Floyd, but the, the, the trouble is recognising how um, the more covert, systemic and everyday racism that happens and challenge that. And, and I wrote something recently on Frank Lampard, who by all accounts is, is a very progressive and forward thinking manager and, and somebody who would um, probably self-identify as an ally. But in the fact when he was asked about the opportunities that he's been afforded as a manager, on the one hand said, I recognize racism in the game, but I don't recognize how I have been the beneficiary of that. When contrasted with the likes of Sol Campbell, Paul Lins, Paul Parker, who started his managerial career uh, as assistant manager at Chelmsford. That is where allyship can't just end at these obvious moments. So, so that's kind of my point is I think, yes, I, I, I celebrate what Ben Mee did, but there needs to be much more and it needs to be said in, in those, you know, as we said earlier, when those banter, when those moments of banter are happening, you know, instead of turning the blind eye or saying to the, to the black player afterwards, I thought that was a bit out of order, challenging it at that point there and showing real unity and, and support so it doesn't just fall on the shoulders of black players it doesn't just fall on the shoulders of black commentators to ask the question it is 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 kind of as i say i'll, I'll pause there yeah I, I i agree with i agree with with that paul just wanted to be conscious to add that, that in about uh, you know dwight mcneil but also as well there there's i in in regards to mark's question i think the education that we deliver at the moment into the environment definitely allows for people to understand their own biases but also how they can 
they can support individuals who are going through a, a lonely process, let's say, so let's put another term on it, a lonely process that, you know, when you see signs, when you think that someone is not their normal self, you know, rather than talk about them, why not talk with them? Do you know what I mean? So rather than go into a group and say, oh, Troy's not looking too great today, is he? Why not go over to Troy and actually talk to Troy and find out what those issues are, you know? Or if he's just having one of those days, which we can all have, you know, but often they extend to something a little bit more where maybe on a one-to-one -one basis, someone will talk up. Um, John Amici, who you'd, you'd probably all know, has done this great thing of not racist, be anti-racist. If you haven't seen it, it's on all the social media platforms. There is always a start point. One of the most massive things for me, and I was on a pod the other day, is as, as a colleague said, <laughs> Google is free. So if anybody wants to find out information or add to their own learning, um, Google is a free platform. You don't have to pay for it. It's, it's a platform where you can type in anything and, and all of a sudden get some information and, and, and help with your own CPD development. Um, but again, I'm going to endorse what the guys have said. The power, not saying that black people, black players don't have powerful voices, because of course they do. But the power of the, we've all heard Gareth Southgate speak. Yeah, and the power with what he speaks in. If we had the England captain endorsing that message as well, if we had players from around the game absolutely taking the weight off a of black player's shoulders almost, and, you know, absolutely taking on the conversation for them, appreciating and understanding the conversation. Raheem Sterling said something that may be gone under the radar about the changing room. And he didn't say what period of time, but he spoke about those, those little comments and those little kind of bits of banter that still exist in this very period of time, you know, and, it, and if that's the case, then again, I don't hear football talking about that much. You know, the media pick up on it a little bit and then they let it go. So what he's trying to say is it still exists to this very day. Joby McEnough came out and said, I think someone has mentioned it in the comments, how he used to always challenge it. Fraser Franks, an ex-player, had done something. He said he got his learning from, um, uh, from a Joby McEnough, who the minute anyone was saying anything untoward, Joby would jump on it and then would provide Fraser with the understanding of the reason I, I, I jumped on that was because of, you know, and, and that's how... That's how we can continue to learn. You know, I, I had the privilege of, just finally, the privilege of talking to the Sky Sports team. Um, and uh, listen, I'm going to say this between us here. The, the subject of power and pace came up. And I've got to be honest, a lot of the team, the pundits, the, the, the presenters that were, Troy, what's wrong, what's wrong with power and pace? Why, why can't we say that? You know, what, what is it a problem? And for anyone that knows, you know, the narrative of just power and pace to describe a black player, which, you know, when I was playing back in the day, Oz, Paul, you'll know this, you know, the black player used to be the big lad at the back who had to pump the ball up to the quick lad at the front and they were both black. That's how we were described. We had no other attributes. We had no leadership skills. We had no technical ability. We had no kind of, of understanding or appreciation of the game, according to the commentator or according to a coach. So, you know, it came back to me, well, you know, Tiore at Wolves, he is powerful and pace, but he's got power and pace. I said, but is there no other way you can describe the lad? Are you saying that that is the only two options you have to describe a player whose crossing ability is good, whose awareness is good, who, who, who's driving to, into various, you know, different spaces into the pitch is good? You know, is, is there no other way you can continue to describe him? And I, I hopefully it gave a thought process in, um, but it, it's, that's what I'm saying. And those people are the influencers. They're the educators for, for everyone that's watching football. So if it becomes acceptable to continually call a player a beast or that he has power and pace, that's how he's going to be described by the many people who will be taking notes, who will then go, oh, I'm going to go out onto my training pitch and I'm going to call the quickest player that I've got who's a bit hench, power and pace. So we have to continue to challenge those lazy thought process because they've existed for far too often in the game and absolutely you know try and empower as many people as possible to to almost live the life appreciate the life understand the life and want to be part of the journey of change and uh, uh, that's probably tougher than what we're making it out to be totally honest because when you've been in a an industry that has always done something one way and has never accepted the conversation from the outside 
it's it's not as easy as to go, well, look, here we are presenting something different. Will you take it on board, you know? Very sad that these stereotypes and, you know, it's stacking, isn't it? Placing placing players of the particular ethnicities in particular positions. It can, it's very sad to hear that it continues. Um, we've overrun slightly. Um, I wanted to, to thank all three panellists for such a fantastic session. Thank you, Ozzy. Thank you, Troy. Thank you, Paul. Um, just before I go, is there anywhere where we could go to find out? Google is free. Is there anywhere where we could go that you recommend to, where we could go and find out more? Uh, absolutely depends what you want to find out. I mean, I created, well, sorry, myself, um, I was on a Guardian pod a couple of weeks ago and we put together this list of, of, of you know, educational books to read. Um, there's, it's a long list. I would say if you, you look on the Guardian website and their podcast that I was on with a guy called Jordan Jarrett Bryant and Elliot Ross, um, there's, a, there's a list of books there that is a start of education. Um, always look on to, obviously, kickitout.org's platform. Um, I rant a lot, so I'm not quite sure my social media would be beneficial to you because I do rant. Um, but if you ever wanted to, you know, I'm there as Town 010. Um, and I'm happy for people to contact me direct. You know, I, I, I always think that after we have a session like this, what is the legacy? So I'll put my email into the into the chat box now, just so that everybody you know who wants to have it can have it. I'm I'm seeing a few friendly faces on there, so they probably already have it. But I'll put it on the chat, um, just so that we can continue conversations offline if people wanted to. And Troy, can I share that in the aftermath of this? When I thank you all for the for for, for the session on Twitter too. Yes, of course, of course you can. Yeah, We're happy for that. Yeah. Concluding comment, Paul. Um. No, I mean, it just, um, it's, it's been a real pleasure and, and hearing people's, um, uh, Troy's and Ozzy's experiences and, and insights. Um, I think what's, what's really encouraging, I think we, we had sort of upwards of 40 people here. And, and I think for, 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 for the audience, it's for us to take this into our everyday. And, and not see and try and make connections between what we're talking about here and, and what happens in our own organizations and industries. And, and, and if, if it's about being an ally or if it's about kind of identifying inequity or just really um, um, participating in meaningful self-awareness and reflection. Um, particularly as, 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 as a white colleague, always be conscious of those spaces where you're, where you're the, where basically there is no one that doesn't look like you um, in, in, in ethnicity or gender or sexuality terms. Uh, and, and just that small action and questioning that is, you can't underestimate the, 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 the sort of powerful anti-racism act that that is because it can't just be left to us uh, and, and your black colleagues whether it be in football whether it be in academia whether it be whatever walk of life to be the only ones to kind of start to to raise this uh, and and fall entirely on us to, to sort of be the bearers of, of trying to make change thank you paul and a final word from ozzy yeah just thanks for the invitation i think you know what the Troy and Paul have just said, it's, this is all about understanding. And the more we understand, the more we can have empathy for a problem that everyone would accept is, is an issue. And we all want to try and do something about it. We're not all going to have exactly the right point, uh, the right idea or the right, you know, we're not going to all agree on the same thing, should I say. But it's about having more understanding. Troy's mentioned about some things that you can go and do some research on. If you need to fall down that YouTube black hole and get in there and watch all those videos and then apply your logic to all of the things that you've seen. It's not about watching one thing and saying, yeah, that's it. Watch a lot of things. Watch things from both sides. Apply your own logic to it and then decide who you want to be and how you're going to behave moving forward. So that's, that's how I'd sort of leave it. Thank you. A great way to end.
thank you very much to all panel members. The thanks are from mine, the Football Collective, really. And thank you for all in the audience. Thank you very much.